So hi, my name is Andrea Wallace. Um, I'm also part of the Lovely Create team. A little bit about my background, I went to the Art Institute of Chicago. So I started as an artist before I worked for five years as a graphic designer, and then went back to law school and became a lawyer. So a lot of my interests lie in the intersections of these different backgrounds, how the backgrounds uh, kind of reveal themselves when users are affected or I'm able to make data visualizations using any of my various backgrounds and then how that incorporates into cultural heritage. Um, so I have a very interdisciplinary approach to research. But part of what I'm gonna be talking about today is I'm gonna do a bit of an introduction into surrogate IP rights, which is kind of the theory that underpins a lot of my research. Then I'm gonna go into a discussion about the exhibition methodology for display at your own risk and illustrate with a few examples. And then bring up Copy That, which is a proposal for perhaps a new resource that maybe we need in the industry. So beginning with surrogate IP rights, I really, I use this term to refer to intellectual property rights that are claimed over digital surrogates. And these are digital surrogates of public domain works. So that means the original copyright has expired or it never existed in the first place. And the claim is uh, expressed either outright through a copyright notification or it's done through the terms and conditions of the website. So there's a few different layers to surrogacy. And we have the image, which is a surrogate for the original material object. In this instance, it's the uh, Dan B's Disappointed Love at the Victorian Albert. But you can see that um, toward the bottom, the Victorian Albert claims a copyright in this image. The image is cropped exactly to the dimensions of the material object, and the true value of the image actually lies in the underlying material object. Then the institution goes to hold, excuse me, to express rights. So we have the copyright by notification. This also extends to either the copyright by contract or a copyright over the data, which is also expressed uh, in the terms and conditions of the website. It'll extend to moral rights. So the institution is asking you to credit it as the author and then also include the information about the artist as well to surrogate licensing, excuse me, surrogate licensing, and then also expressing third party rights. When visitors go to the cultural institution and they wanna take their own photographs of the work, the restrictions on visitor photography may extend to preventing people from using it for uh, commercial purposes, maybe only personal and research purposes. So these are third party rights that are also expressed through terms and conditions and express a, like a, a surrogate copyright over the visitor's work as well. And then all of this is, expre is, is expressed through a surrogate party. So in this instance, it's the Victorian Albert. Um, but it, you know, really, this is a practice that's been happening for years. We've always taken photographs of the works that we've used and either made those available for uh, transparencies or for publication. But now with digitization, it's becoming a much bigger issue. But it's also important that we recognize the need to generate revenue and the need to make sure that digitization is funded and that cultural institutions, uh, the revenue that's being allocated to them by the government is starting to shrink. So this was kind of where Display at Your Own Risk came through. I started to think, what would, I ha what would happen if I looked at the institutions as the authors themselves? Could I learn anything about the copyright claim, the legitimacy to the copyright claim, or the exercise of intellectual property rights over the digital surrogates in the process? And decided to approach the issue from three perspectives. So the user perspective, the legal and academic perspective, and then also the cultural institutions perspective. So here we have Display at Your Own Risk, which is an exhibition of digital surrogates made available by cultural institutions, but it's also been produced by cultural institutions. So the National Library of Scotland and the Glasgow Print Studio uh, did all of the printing for the exhibition. We had it digitized by the University of Glasgow Archive Services. So it was very much um, kind of a, an amalgamation of cultural institutions coming together to, prevent, to present this exhibition. That went into the concept, but then also the terminology that was used. So we have, of course, the artist, the expression of the idea, and the material object, but then that material object is digitized by the cultural institution and made available online, which is the digital surrogate. Then the digital surrogate is what I downloaded and printed, creating a material surrogate, which is on the wall. Then we took the material surrogate, digitized that, and created exhibition photography that we also released online. So it gets pretty meta, which is why we have this little infographic to help ex uh, explain. But to sample um, the various images that I used, 
I started with a list from the Art, News, Art Newspaper's 2014 uh, data on exhibition attendance. Wikipedia had compiled that into a list of the top 100 most attended institutions. Then of those 100 institutions, I added to the list with institutions known to have open collections, uh, institutions from the library and archive sector to balance it out, institutions from underrepresented jurisdictions, and especially jurisdictions that had fair use or fair dealing. And I visited nearly every website, starting with the homepage and working my way to find the institution's policy, where the policy was located, I tracked what it was called, how many steps it took to find it, any copyright information, where that was located, whether on the homepage, the terms and condition, directly next to the image, um, if, it was, if the terms and conditions were translated into any other languages, and so on. Then um, I organized it into a list of works that were organized by risk. And display at your own risk actually talks to the different types of risk that are uh, experienced by whoever might be interacting with these works. So there's the cultural institutions who perceive risk in putting them online. Because if you put it online and you make it available to anyone, are they gonna download it? Are they gonna call it their own? Are they gonna use it in a derogatory manner? We have the stewardship to protect the work, to protect the moral rights of the author that may be perpetual in some jurisdictions. So it's the risk that the cultural institutions perceive, but it's the risk that I assessed in going through and assigning either an open, low risk, or medium risk, or high risk uh, analysis in organizing them so that the user could make an educated decision as to which pieces they would want to use in the open source exhibition and what approach to risk they are willing to take. So my initial criteria, once I had this massive list of, uh, ex or excuse me, of cultural institutions, was to start with works in the public domain for obvious reasons, and then not be able to pick a, a work that would print um, larger than 45 inches in the shortest size, and that was just a print restriction. Um, then I visited each website and downloaded the works in the institution that they put forth as their highlights. If there were no highlights, I looked for kind of objectively recognizable images, things that you all might recognize either because of the artist, um, I tried to represent gender appropriately, also subject matter, culture, medium, technique, so to get as wide of a sweeping collection to see what would happen when we printed these out as possible. And I also restricted the cultural institutions, uh, or the selections to the cultural institutions main website. So this is the example of the Ophelia, which I downloaded October 30th in 2016. But the Tate also has Tate images, and they make a different uh, image available on Tate images. So I didn't use any of the commercial institutions' websites, nor did I go to Wikimedia or Europeana, where they might have made contributions as well, and sometimes in a higher resolution, because really cult or users should be going to the cultural institution as the source for all of uh, the digital cultural heritage that is reused online but also because a different set of terms and conditions will apply to images taken from the main website versus the cultural or the terms and conditions that go through the licensing website. So even that would become really difficult to manage for a user as well. It all depends on where you get the image and at what time. And then I try to curate it within a three week period because as we all know, policies are consistently changing. So for example, the Tate image that I downloaded on the bottom left hand corner, you can see it says license this image. When you click that, it will take you to the Tate Images website. You can also right click and download the image directly from the main website. But today, if you go back, this image has been released under a Creative Commons license. That still means that the image that I downloaded and made available in the open source exhibition is bound to the earlier set of terms and conditions. So trying to track the changes in the policy and to prevent policy changes from occurring during the creation was also a goal. So this is just a sample of some of the names of the online policies. I tried to track where they were located, either on the home page or how many clicks you had to do to find them. I found that they were called anything from Impressum to Disclaimer Copyrights, which included no such disclaimer, um, about this site, contact. Of the 130 institutions that I looked at, copyright was the most common, but only 16 institutions actually used that as a term. One of, I think, the more interesting case studies was the MKG Hamburg. So it took me about six steps to find the copyright policy, and it was located on the contact page, just underneath the legal information. So the terms for the MKG Hamburg are actually mirrored off of Europeana's usage guidelines for public domain works. However, it omits a key paragraph 
it copies almost word for word everything except for the usage guide is based on goodwill. It is not a legal contract, and we ask that you respect it. So given the context of where it's located, just underneath the legal information, someone might look at this and not necessarily know that, oh, I can really be using this for any type of use, commercial whatsoever, because it might have a bit of an intimidating appearance. But then compare that to the SMK, National Museum of Denmark, which also mirrors the Europeana guidelines. It's a gorgeous policy, and they use language that encourages users to play with the images. Um, this one says, images are in the public domain. Uh, they're, they're like tools in a toolbox. You can use them for all manners and purposes. Feel free to let your imagination run wild. Like, that's gorgeous. Then they also use the uh, European guidelines, which say this usage is based on goodwill. It's not a legal contract. We ask that you respect it, but it's modified. And here the SMK says we urge you to respect them. So there's still this sense of trying to make sure that people are really following the terms and conditions, even if they permit anything. And then interestingly, this specific information isn't on the free use of, or excuse me, the use of images in text portion of the website. It's on the free downloads of Artworks website. So their policies are actually split in two different places. And as a user, if you go to one to try to find this information, and that might be somewhere else, you might think that that's all that exists for that policy. So you wouldn't necessarily search around to see if there's any other nuggets of information hidden. Another is the Rijksmuseum. So the Rijksmuseum, the way that you look at the policy is you actually have to go to the organization's homepage, not the Rijksmuseum's homepage. And down on the bottom corner, it says terms. When you click on terms, it takes you to just this basic page that has this information and this information alone. That first line that says terms and conditions governing the use of the website downloads a direct, uh, excuse me, a PDF directly to your hard drive with the terms and conditions. So it's not even located on the website, which makes you wonder if it actually applies to anything. But in looking at the material surrogates as well, you start to make these connections that you wouldn't necessarily make when you're in the actual gallery. So I don't know if any of you have walked up to the Mona Lisa and thought, oh, that's huge. That's what I thought when I printed it off because I checked the dimensions a couple of times, I made sure that we had printed it correctly, and it really is that exact size. When you go and you see it in the gallery, you can't get that close. The walls are huge. It looks so much more smaller by comparison. But we ended up doing a search online before we convinced and found a Google image of JFK in front of it, stood right beside it for proportion to make sure that that was, in fact, the dimensions of the artwork. It's also unframed in the, the digital surrogate. But in this one, it's framed. So that might encroach on a, a bit of the information that's provided by the cultural institution. And then some of the material surrogates are so detailed that there's information you wouldn't be able to notice if you were actually at the gallery. So this Rijksmuseum image, you can see the cracks in the paint, you can see the brush strokes along the edge because it's unframed. These are images that can actually be used for legitimate and serious academic research. So making them available online in this manner allows people to use them not just for reference, but for uh, research and to create new cultural goods as well. I became a bit obsessed with metadata going through this project. I don't know if anyone's ever spoken that out loud before. But um, so going through the 100 digital surrogates and extracting all the metadata, I found that 37 had no metadata at all. Um, that puts them at risk for becoming de facto orphan works. If they're released to the internet, someone takes them and uses them somewhere else. There's no metadata. It's an orphan work that's now floating around. Then 65 of those works contained no rights information whatsoever at all either. So again, if it gets divorced from the context of the website and there is rights information um, that the website claims over it, but it's not attached to the metadata, someone could unintentionally infringe on a copyright and reusing it. Then there is information that was often contradictory. So this is a piece that's at the British Library and it says right on the page, beautifully public domain, it links you to the terms and conditions for uh, Creative Commons for the public domain. But then in the metadata, it says copyright British Library Board. So depending on when a policy was made and when something was digitized, these things can start to create tensions when, with the digital realm. Another discovery that I'm obsessed with is the metadata of the Rijksmuseum. So every piece that I downloaded from the Rijksmuseum has a copyright attached in the metadata. And we all know and love the Rijksmuseum and all the wonderful things that they've done to really push the industry forward and create these new opportunities for people to act or react and engage with art. But when you go to the, like, the page for this specific painting, that red box is all you'll see. So this is within um, the Rijks studio. Then if you scroll down, there's a tiny red arrow where it says object data, which reveals this. 
And the object data, it says acquisition and rights, and it has all information that pertains to the material object. So it doesn't necessarily inform you whether or not the image is copyright or public domain, and neither do the, or the terms and conditions which aren't located on the website. But when you click the public domain, it goes straight to the copyright, the no copyright claim through Creative Commons. So looking at this, it says the person associated with the work has dedicated it to the public domain. Well, the person who made this work is Abraham Mignon, and he didn't dedicate it to the work in the 1600s, which is when it was painted and it died, because copyright didn't know as we existed, or didn't exist back then as we know it today. So I checked the metadata, and that's where I found in the IPTC uh, application the copyright information for Reich's Museum in every image that I downloaded. And I got some of the lower resolution, the higher resolution, just to see. But you know, it could be because the Reich's Museum closed down for 10 years, and maybe their policy changed halfway through the digitization process. Maybe they just didn't update the metadata. It's a huge undertaking, especially for a collection like the Reich's Museum. Still, it could chill use if someone opens this up and they see that there is a copyright in the metadata, and it's not necessarily reflected in the terms and conditions that the works are in the public domain. Another really fun meta discovery is with the British Library, this Alice in Wonderland painting. The subject line actually resembles abstract poetry. Like it's incredibly fun to kind of read through this and try to consider why they came up with these keywords and why they're so um, repetitive, but it's beautiful. Another one, the Yale Center for British Art, some of the metadata was so detailed that you could see uh, the process by which the digital surrogate was made. So this is actually a scan of a 1997 photograph transparency, which makes it like super meta in and of itself. It's a scan that was digitized and then made available online. I love it. Um, then making it available. So the next step was to put this all into an open source exhibition that users could then download and interact with this as well. So that's where we kind of stepped in the cultural institutions shoes to see how this process would work. We decided to make it available on World Intellectual Property Day, which was April 26th, and they promoted it on their Facebook page, so that was super fun. Um, the way that we displayed it on the website, we tried to make it so that users could zoom in and see the detail of the works to decide whether they wanted to print certain ones, because if you step back from some of the more pixelated works, they look like they're fabulous quality, but as you get right up close to them, that's where you see that the detail starts to disappear. Then we continued with the concept. So we made um, a fully realized exhibition companion, which was a catalog of all the works and a, a, a publication that had multiple different essays written by individuals in the field. All of the catalogs of the pieces, so each has its own spread with information about the digital surrogate, the material surrogate, the material object, and any licensing information, as well as metadata and details of the images. And then we invited um, essays from a variety of contributors, so scholars, lawyers, industry practitioners, artists, everyone who's been working with public domain works and data and is really hands-on on the process and the issues to try to give it a little bit of a balanced um, commentary. Then organizing the open source exhibition, we took note from several cultural institutions who made their works available online but then packaged it in ways that were open to the user. We soon understood that this was going to take an incredible amount of information to tell everyone what they could and couldn't do about every individual piece, but that's kind of what cultural institutions are going through, so it was very appropriate for us to go through that process as well. And we organized it in a way that you could download the photography file, you could curate your own exhibition um, based off of going and downloading your own works, you could use the works that we downloaded, all the information was in every file organized according to risk, and then we put all of the research online as well. So we try to make it all open and available as a cultural institution would in this process. So in doing this, um, we started to think, okay, are we overburdening users with all this information? Like, I'd like to think not, but this may really be the state of how crazy the issues are at the moment, uh, which is where part of my next project comes in. In gathering data to start to envision the ways that others could be using all of the data, I started to develop these kind of interactive graphs that started to help people understand what exactly they could and couldn't do. So on this graph on the left-hand side, we have cultural institutions, and then along the top are things that you can do on-site and things that you can do online, like social media, or can I draw or sketch, or can I use a photograph that I've taken for commercial purposes. Um, the copyright that's in that box means that the cultural institution claims a copyright over the digital surrogate, where it says public domain, that's the National Library of Wales, and currently in the United Kingdom, they're the only institution I've come across that has put their works in the public domain. Um, but 
I'm going to try to develop this into a website called Copy That. So the idea is that the user, if they're going to be interacting with a cultural institution, has one place to go to find out everything that they need to know about how they can access and inter interact with the works. It begins with the Copy That Comparator, which is a version of that graph that I showed. But ideally, the user will be able to scan over the works with the, um, the mouse, and then the information will pop up and tell them specifically what they can or can't do. It also allows users to make their own valuations and assessments about how open or closed a uh, cultural institution's policy is. Then an access generator. So we have all of the questions. You click on the question, can I use these images commercially? It will only pull up the institutions that allow you to use and access those works. Um, and then when you click on the institution, it will give you the exact information as well as to how you can do that. With the policy translator, which takes all of the policies that cultural institutions have in various areas of their websites and just gets the important stuff out. Like, as a lawyer, I know that there's a lot of things that have to go into a policy in order to make sure that the institution is protected and the user understands their obligations. But as a user, when you see that type of information and it's phrased in a negative way, you can't do this and you can't do this, it's really intimidating. So. What, do we, what can we do? Social media, online use, using data. How do we phrase this in a way that is a little bit more comprehensive for the, the people who are trying to access and use the works? It also aggregates the various areas of information. So for example, this is the National Library of Wales uh, policy. All of the information that you would need if you're going to the institution or you're going to the website is located in seven different places on the institution's website. The gem of information that tells you if it's a public domain work, it's a public domain digital surrogate, isn't in the copyright um, policy. It's actually in the intellectual property rights policy. So as a user, if you went to go find that information, and then you went to a web page and you saw a copyright right there, even though the work was in the public domain, you might not necessarily know that that's a work that you can use. And this is another issue that institutions are facing, because interfaces that have been developed for the world of 2,000 plus internet are no longer adaptable for the way that we need for digital rights uh, and assets management. So this is kind of a way for people to be able to rely or at least decipher the information that's in various places on an internet, on, excuse me, on a website, and to make it available in a way that gives them access. And then also a copyright or a copy that archive. Take all the policies, put them in one place. How can we see that they've changed over the years? If you're an institution and you're trying to come up with a new policy, what is someone else doing? A way to compare and contrast how restrictive or how open other policies might be, as well as an about page, because public education is the ultimate goal. And then something playful, our own terms and conditions, how you use the website, um, how it applies to you as a user, and it's definitely not legal advice. We always like to include that as well. Um, but trying to stress the don't plagiarize, disseminate, respect the artwork, a lot of the European principles that they include in their usage guides as well. Because ultimately, it's all about being fun and interacting with art. Um, cultural institutions have been doing a lot of different things to get people to interact with the works that they have in their collection. Uh, they've been adapting policies according to technology, however it needs to do, but it's a long process, it's sensitive, and um, we understand that. So we wanted to do that too. We wanted to encourage people to interact with the works in different areas that they might not actually ever be able to go see um, at the physical location because of financial restrictions and global warming. Um, but, you know, create new works as well. Like, we have so many people who are wearing different pieces and bits of the images. Um, oh, I myself have on the metadata skirt for the Rijksmuseum. So this is copyright Rijksmuseum, just FYI. Um, and then access, making sure that access is communicated as being key so that the works continue to be appreciated and treasured by current and future generations. The end. <laughs>